Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think with this project, you're going to see a lot of optionality in a project and how you can develop a project. I'm a strong believer when you have lots of options on your path forward, you can make very good economic decisions. Uh, when you look at a lot of mines that are being produced in the future, and the way companies look at it, a lot of companies look at bigger is better. Well, I'm not a proponent of that. I always look at the economics, and sometimes smaller projects and the way you development are much more economic for your company in the cash flow and longevity. Uh, Gold Reach, we're located in uh, West Central British Columbia. We have, we're in an area of great infrastructure. It's not a remote area. Uh, we're right next to a producing mine, which I will focus on later as we go through it. Uh, jurisdiction, I agree with a lot of the speakers here. Jurisdiction is very important. As you see things that have happened uh, in the world, uh, I know firsthand about juris <coughs> jurisdictional risk. I've been through three revolutions myself. Uh, so they do add up. Having a team to go forward is very, uh, very valuable because if you don't have a team, you're not going to go anywhere. With the UTSA project, you know, there's a phenomenal amount of work that has been completed, 144 kilometers of drilling and over $25 million spent. Uh, excellent infrastructure as you're going to see and also uh, strong First Nation support. Okay, let's talk about jurisdiction, you know. Let's talk about permitting. Everybody says, okay, yes, very favorable for permitting. They have timelines and that. Well, I agree, you know. Over a year ago, there was a tailings dam uh, failure in British Columbia spooked the market big time. A lot of markets said you're never going to permit another mine in British Columbia. Well, here's the facts. Since that tailings dam spill, all these projects have been permitted in British Columbia. Those are the facts. Can't argue that. Share structure. <clears throat> we're a tightly held company. Sometimes you know, it's almost like we're a, a private shell company. 41 million shares outstanding. Uh, we're very tightly held, sometimes too tightly held, with 74% being held by directors, officers, and close associates. Uh, our largest shareholder is a businessman from the Prince George or the project area in British Columbia, and uh, we have quite a few strong individuals like that to continue to support this company as we go through. The Utsida project is a polymetallic porphyry copper deposit. Copper is the number one element, so that's basically how we're going to uh, approach the scenario as we go forward. Now, like I said, 144 kilometers of drilling, $25 million spent, that's pretty good share structure for that. Uh, metallurgical recoveries is very optimistic and similar to the producing mine right next door, which is the same porphyry system that we have. The benefit of this project, you know, it's in the past it's been touted as a large, low-grade resource, you know, almost half a billion tons. Well, when I started, and the reason that Goldreach brought me on was to look at it, refocus it, the high-grade core starts right at surface. Do we have a project? that is even economic at today's prices. As you can see, the red circles, uh, we have the two seal deposits and the ox deposits, and that is the basis of our work that we're going forward. In September this year, we announced uh, that we're starting a preliminary economic assessment. We're, let's look back at it business-wise. We're a single asset company, if the PEA is negative, it's, it could be a company killer. We took June, July, August, and September, 
And we did, we recalculated uh, our resource estimate because there was some drilling that wasn't included. And we did a lot of in-house engineering work, basically to the same scale as what you would do in a preliminary economic assessment and can be used in the preliminary economic assessment. It's in-house work, we know what our results are, hence we are going forward, even, even with these prices that we have today. Uh, I have given our engineers a minimum target price, which after tax is, you know, three digits, and our IRRs at, with respectable ranges. The aspect with the PEA, we are assuming that one way or another, the ore from the UTSA project will go into the Huckleberry Mill, which is right there. The Huckleberry Mill has been in production for 17 years. All the electricity is there. The workforce is there. The mill is there. The tailings facilities are there for what they have in their operation. It's a mine life. And you can look at the public information, it has a limited mine life with a pretty substantial closure cost. I'm sure those closure costs would like to be deferred. And let's face it, you know, transaction wise, we're assuming that a transaction may happen, maybe from the Huckleberry side towards Goldreach or from the Goldreach side towards us. There are numerous discussions that are, that are going on at this time. Uh, Possibilities here are endless. Worst case scenarios, if, if the mine shuts down, you could buy it as what we've seen in the previous company here. You buy the mill and infrastructure, five or 10 cents on the dollar. No need to spend $400 million to buy a brand new mill. You could use a mine dealt pit as your tailing facilities. Regulators for environmental purposes see that as very favorable. You wouldn't have to worry about a mine failure when your pit is almost 300 meters deep, built out of solid rock. There are lots of scenarios. One of our biggest uh, concerns as we go forward with our PEA is transporting the ore from our projects to the Huckleberry Mill. So we're looking at it in different ways. We're looking at trucking it with haul trucks. We're looking at trucking it with uh, highway trucks, using barging, uh, operations or conveyors, either whether it's a sus suspended conveyor or floating conveyors. Uh, our trade-off study is almost complete uh, and it's quite optimistic and really helps us focus the way we're going to structure our PA as we go forward. Now, like I said before, bigger is not always better. As you can see here, there's the 0.2 cutoff resources, you know, almost, you know, over 400 million tons, low grade, in higher metal prices. Yeah, there's a, it has some economic potential. But in today's world, and let's, you know, my focus is, we're gonna look at the 0.4 cutoff material where you can see the copper grade by itself is equivalent to producing mines that are in production in British Columbia and making money, making a profit. Now, let's add on, you've got the gold content, the molly content, the silver content. We're approaching, you know, close to half a percent copper equivalent, which is very optimistic. The Huckleberry mine next to us from their public reports, you can see that they're, they're making a profit at, uh, just over 0.3% copper. Gives relevance to this. Our copper grade is, is close to theirs, but then we've got the sweetener in the, uh, you know, with the byproducts, almost 20% more value per ton. The table on the right, you can see, you know, the, the breakdown of the metal content uh, between copper, gold, moly, and silver. And if you look at using the 0.4 cutoff, you know, you're over a billion pounds of copper. Now, British Columbia deposits are lower grade when you look at the makeup of all these deposits. Everybody says when they look at your project, oh, the grades are so low. Well, 
I've, I've heard this comment before with gold mines. My comment is, what are you comparing it to? Well, South America, you know, they're 0 0.4, 0 0.5 or higher, stuff like that. I said, yeah, that's correct. We don't have to pump water up 4,000 meters to their mine. We have cheap power costs in British Columbia. Industrial power cost in British Columbia is four cents a kilowatt hour. You know, that's very significant. Now, when you compare the UTSA to other producing mines or projects in British Columbia, you can see our copper grade, it's average. It's not the lowest, it's not the highest. And then you can also see it with the other metals uh, added into it. We fit the range of mines that have been producing and making money in British Columbia. Now here's the lay of the land. In the, in the forefront, you can see the flat topography of where the Utsa deposit are. Across the other side of the valley, you can see the producing Huckleberry mine. It's been producing for 17 years. We have the, you know, the luxury of flat topography. One thing to note, the snow in this area in British Columbia, you know, it's maybe four, five, six, seven meters. It's not like some of these other projects in British Columbia where you're getting, you know, close to 20 meters of snow. This mine has been proven to work all year round. It's favorable conditions. Just another luxury that this area and this project has. So as we're going forward, you know, uh, one of the work programs that we initially started when I, uh, back in June, we said, okay, we're gonna, we're going to drill uh, 10,000 meters. With our engineering work that we did during the summer, we do not have to do that program. We have shown, uh, we will show that our economics are good the way they are with the current resource base. Now, here's an important fact about PEAs. A lot of companies, usually when they do a PEA, their, their uh, ratio of measured indicated are, are not far off 50-50. The resources that we are using in our PEA, 98% of those resources are measured and indicated. That's a very good confidence. You don't have, you know, your uh, level of degree of variability, uh, up and down dip along strike. When you look at companies, when they've done a PEA and then gone on to uh, feasibility studies, when your percentage of measured and indicated are at a high percentage, your feasibility results are not far off what your PEA numbers are. Now, like I said, we have a large resource base, as you can see here in the blue and the purple. In the PEA, we are only targeting those areas in those red pit shells, okay? And on the left-hand diagram, you can see the different resources. The large pit, that's the global pit 0.2 cutoff. Well, what we're looking at as a PEA, as phase one, are these smaller pits in here, focusing around somewhere between a 10 and a 15 year mine life based on the processing rates at the mill next door. You've already seen the grade. You know that the, it has 20% more value per ton than the mine next door that is making a profit, even at today's prices. Uh, unfortunately, I'd love to tell you what the number, what, what the results are gonna be, but uh, can't do that until they're being released publicly. Uh, we announced that the results would be out in Q2 next year we're targeting to push that if we can, because a lot of the in-house engineering work that we did this past summer can be used directly in that PEA. Now, recoveries, you can see for a porphyry copper, copper uh, deposit, you know, we have pretty good recoveries. The two pie charts on the bottom, you can see the metal distribution, two of our deposits, you know, are 45 to 55% copper, Look at the gold content, you know. One has, you know, 40% gold aspect to it. Those are nice kickers. I hope everybody's right and the gold price will go up. On another one of our deposits, you can see that uh, Molly starts to kick in. 
and, and that's uh, favorable with the, with the grades that we have for Molly. Uh, I didn't point them out on the table, but uh, you know, our, our Molly grades are quite respectable as we go forward. Now, I talked about phase one in the previous diagram that we're focusing on an, on an area of about uh, you know, 70 to 100 million ton scenario. That as phase one. And these lines here represent the pit shells on a flat level. Now, the red and the yellow is what you have to focus on. That is the higher grade mineralization. As you can see, that mineralization within those pit shells in phase one and phase two, which phase two is plus 125 million tons uh, that we know of so far, those high grade zones have not been you know, cut off. We don't need to do them right now for phase one because they're right at the boundaries. That, that will be applied to phase two. But if it's positive, with phase one, you have a 10 year, 10 to 12 year mine life, 15 year mine life, to get all that drilling done for phase two pit expansion. These diagrams, these cross sections, I wanted to highlight the yellow and the red contours. This is to illustrate that the higher grade mineralization starts right at bedrock surface and continues down. Very favorable. Now even if you went to a larger, uh, let's say phase two or even uh, where you start to ramp up, you want to increase the tonnage to 60,000 tons a day, you would mine it starting with the high grade first logistically. You want to get your fast uh, payback, then you'll just keep expanding the pits out with a series of pushbacks. So, you know, some people would say, okay, well you're going after the higher grade mineralization you're going to uh, sterilize the rest of the deposit. Well, no, you're not. It's a systematic approach. Even if you were starting, like if you had $4 copper and you were going after the mega pit, you would still look at developing the pits in this, at the manner we would with, with phase one. So that's basically what we're looking at in the PEA. We're targeting a CapEx $100 million range got to keep in mind, we don't have to build a mill. Our biggest thing is how's, how do we get the ore over to the mill. Its conveyors seem to be the, the most likely way we're going to do it. And it's all downhill. So it's not really going to be that big of a power consumer. We're probably going to have to put a braking system on it. And some people like to have green power. Well, if you've got to put a braking system on it, why don't you put a generator on, on the conveyor and generate green power and help you know, sustain your operation with power that you generate from your operation. So that's where we are with the current resources that we have today. However, the exploration upside potential for this project is, is phenomenal. I'm a true believer the best place to look for a mine is around a producing mine. And we have that scenario. We're six kilometers from it. We've identified the easy known mineralized deposits. We've, and you can see them in the different uh, areas here, the seal deposits, extensions. We have completed geophysics that have the same signatures over our known deposits which have no drilling. Those targets are drill ready. But we've drilled enough. We have enough resources to, let's say, go towards a, a production environment. You know, because we look at the, the mine next door, from the public information, you know, they say uh, six year mine life. Okay, so let's look at it. We got a year to year and a half engineering work we got two to three years worth of permitting. There's five years. Then you got six, maybe nine months worth of construction. Boy, timing is great for everybody, for all parties concerned. This is just a, a diagram of one of our deposits here, the Ox deposit. This is the one that, uh, as you can see here, Molly uh, takes up uh, a big percentage of the byproducts. So you can see it's, it's favorable. Uh, 
Two of the deposits are non-acid generating, which is very favorable for the environmental side. So here's just another view of the, the targets we have with our known deposits uh, and with our targets that we have outlined. You know, if somebody wanted to come in or if we raised a pile of money, you could start testing those targets. But I don't see the need for that. Target rich, it's got a long-term future. That's what you want to see on an exploration property. Very target rich. I love those areas. Uh, you know, I worked at the Kumtor Mine in Kyrgyzstan. That was one of the best areas that I've ever seen for target-rich environment. It just phenomenal. Even in the project I worked in Africa, same thing. You just keep expanding your resources. You could spend millions of dollars exploring, but someday you have to make a decision. Let's make money. So here's our total land package. You know, 70 million uh, square hectares, or sorry, 70,000 square hectares. And the t deposits we're looking at only cover an area of about 15% of the project area. So you can see how small an area that we're focusing our PEA and production aspects on. The rest is long term future. You know, jurisdictional risk is a big thing. Uh, I've talked about it before. In British Columbia, everybody, and well, not just British Columbia, but in Canada, First Nations. There's been some difficulties in different areas, and I've always looked at it. First Nations uh, groups are like families. And well, basically they are families. Some areas are functional families, some areas they're dysfunctional families. We are very fortunate with the First Nations groups that we have. It's the same First Nations groups that the Huckleberry Mine deals with and has been in production for 17 years. We employ them, they, they run our exploration camp for the catering services. We hire them uh, for core splitting. They build our roads, our uh, uh, bridges. They're great workers and our path going forward, we will continue to use them. They're a very valuable resource to us. So, Basically, uh, highlights here, summary. We have an overall large resource. Copper price goes back up to four bucks, uh, yeah. Then you've got a different mining scenario. But we're targeting right now at the higher grade scenarios, which could make you a profit at today's prices. Lots of upside potential uh, for exploration. We have all kinds of luxuries, road access, hydropower, you know and uh, other you know, luxuries that I have mentioned. And I'd like to thank you for listening to our story.